Good morning. Good morning. We're going to start our program for today on improving the care of people with disabilities through research, education, policy, and advocacy. Um, oftentimes, when we talk about issues of uh, health disparities or we talk about um, diversity in populations, people first think of uh, race, ethnicity, or they think of gender, but they don't think about the multiple identities that many of us have. And so you can't bucket individuals. You can't say this person is disabled alone or black alone or a woman alone, that we hold multiple identities. And I think it's important that we lift up all the groups that are sitting on the margins together and find ways that collectively we can address issues of disparity, of marginalization, of bias, and whatever ism is tweeted that day. So I am so pleased that we have this program. Uh, this is part of our leadership and faculty development conference, but it's also part of our equity and social justice series that's offered through our office at the medical school, um, where Alden Landry has played a key role um, but I also want to acknowledge Ying Wong and Teresa Carter for the work that they do to make this series work. And I want to do a special shout out to Chloe, um, who is, where is Chloe? Don't see her right now. She was here. She was here. She was outside. Um, one of our alumni fellows who was really instrumental in helping to pull this together. And thank you for that, Chloe. Um, I'm going to introduce Alden. He's an emergency medicine physician at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and the founder of Motivating Pathways, an assistant professor in emergency medicine, and also faculty at the Disparity Solution Center at Massachusetts General Hospital. And like all the things at Harvard Medical School, also a faculty assistant director in our office uh, at the medical school and heading uh, equity components of the curriculum for the medical school and the program in medical education and an assistant director of Castle Society within the medical school. So if Harvard does nothing else, it gives you a lot of titles. Um, uh, but has been a former fellow, an alum of the uh, Commonwealth Fund Fellowship Program, um, but a clear leader um, in moving us towards equity and social justice. Alden Landry. Good morning, everyone. So I'm going to keep my comments brief just because I want to make sure we allow time for our amazing um, discussions that we're going to have today. We have some outstanding presentations from amazing people who are leaders in the field. Um, but just to give a little context to our equity and social justice work we've been doing here at HMS, um, when we were tasked, when I was particularly tasked with this um, about two years ago, um, you know, we started thinking about what topics and discussions we wanted to have as far as equity and social justice. And we started tiptoeing into the waters um, of this. And we found that um, it's one of those field the dream situations, if you build it, they will come. Um, because there's a lot of individuals who are in our community, uh, specifically at Harvard, but then also uh, in the Boston area that are interested in having these conversations because of the impact that it has on patients. And oftentimes we think about um, the work that we're doing is um, outward facing, um, but we oftentimes miss the boat because we don't include the community. And with our equity and social justice work, we've been able to bring in the community into our discussions and really um, help to um, not only um, have these discussions on an academic level, but also have them on a personal level. And I think that's what you're going to hear today um, through our uh, cadre of speakers that we have. Um, this topic is uh, extremely interesting to me and something that I will admit that I'm relatively uh, naive to and I think that we're all going to have an opportunity to learn from our speakers um, and I ask that you truly engage in this opportunity and, and uh, think about how you can take this back to your practice to the policy work that you do uh, and also how you can just overall be a, uh, a better ally and advocate for the patients that you serve and the communities that you work with. Um, with that I want to go ahead and introduce our first speaker. Um, which is uh, Dr. Franmi um, Okalami. And uh, when we were having our conversation about how he wanted me to introduce him, uh, he said, keep it brief because my story comes out in his presentation, so I'm happy to do so. But his bio is in, uh, in, in the book. 
Uh, so please take a look at his bio, but also pay attention to the story he's about to tell. So Joan always gives me a hard time about all the titles that I have. Well, it's good to know that uh, University of Michigan doesn't hold back on titles either, because uh, Farami has a number of titles, including founder and executive director of uh, Okalami Strong. He's an assistant professor of family medicine and physical medicine and rehabilitation. He's faculty lead for student success in the Office of Health Equity and Inclusion and Michigan Medicine. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Farami. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alden. Thank you, Dr. Reed. Thank you, Dr. Slocum. Thank you, Teresa and Ying and Christine and everybody who has made this several days that you put together here already very, very wonderful. It is my distinct honor and pleasure to join you. And something that I, I tell each group that I speak to is that I don't actually like giving talks, but I like starting conversations. And so I want this to actually be a conversation. And I, I told some people yesterday at dinner that their mistake was sitting with me because now that I know their names, I can call on them if people aren't speaking. But I really do. I hope to engage you because I feel as though if at the end of this, I have a, a 75 minutes, right? I'm not teasing. At the, end of the, <laughs> at the end of this 30 minutes or so, if I'm the only voice that we hear today, then we're missing the opportunity to be able to engage and have everybody have a seat at the table to allow everybody's voice to be heard. And in academic medicine in particular, I think that we don't always do a good job of allowing everyone to have a seat at the table. And some of the conversation that we'll have today will sort of unpack why that sometimes is. Sometimes people can't get to the table. Sometimes people aren't invited to the table. Sometimes people are told to get out of the room. And so I really want us to be honest about the things that we think, the things that we see, the things that we feel, because if we're not able to do that, then we're not able to move the needle forward by acknowledging where we actually are. So I'll give a couple slides that I want us to discuss. I'll start with a video, and then with each slide, I, I sort of have a little story of my life that will go along with it to then just hopefully provide some context for who I am and why I'm here. Because indeed, you know, Dr. Landry Alden asked me what part of my bio he I wanted him to say, and I thought, you know, for your time as well, he could read the whole bio, and then I could say it again, and I think that it's, it's better to see it in the way that it kind of unfolds, and, and in a way, I don't want you to know everything about me before I speak. I want those things to start coming out as we're talking so that some of the things that are going to happen naturally, you're going to make certain leaps when you hear things that if you read an entire bio, you think you may already know who's speaking. You think you already know the things that the person's gonna say and the thoughts they may have. So my hope is that by doing it this way, it will, it will allow for more conversation. It will allow some of those preconceived notions that may come up based on uh, someone's bio to, to be delayed a bit. So this is just the first slide of title and everywhere you're supposed to have your disclosures and I don't believe I have any disclosures pertinent to today, but I am also the, the chief external physician consultant and ability awareness advocate for guardian life and, and disability insurance. And this is how I actually would like to start. Very few medical schools have a dedicated disability curriculum. Even as practitioners, taking care of individuals with disabilities is not something that most people are comfortable with. As we go into medicine, we're going to encounter people with disabilities. We're going to encounter people with different levels of function. And it's something that we are not doing a good job of preparing our medical students for a world where you go into a room and your patient might come in in a wheelchair. And then how do you address that? How do you get them onto the examination table? How do you perform your physical exam when the person can't lift their leg for you? A lot of people don't know how to treat you just because of lack of knowledge of it. Not because they don't want to, but because they just don't know how. 
And I have a catchphrase that I use called disabusing disability, which is hoping to demonstrate that being disabled does not mean that one is unable. And we don't talk about that to medical students. And so as a physician, I think I want medical students to know that it's okay to be human. As much as I roll into the room with my patients, I think that they, they don't see the chair in the same way because they see me as human. And as long as I'm able to demonstrate my competence in whatever it is that we're talking about that day, they actually, I feel, connect with me more. And so I think that if we start to insert that education in the beginning by showing them that if you yourself have some sort of disability or limitation, that does not mean that you're not gonna be a good physician. And in fact, you may be able to advocate for your patients in a way that others may not understand the ability to do. And that can have an amazing impact in not just the way that your medical education goes, but the way that you can really account for the entire population of people that we'll be caring for. So Dr. Reed already started by talking about the fact that when we talk about diversity, when we talk about equity, inclusion, oop, giving things away, when we talk about it, we often automatically think people are talking about race. And I'll be quite honest, a lot of people don't like that, and that pushes some people away. And so when people think that the only thing you're referencing when you're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion is race, the people that think that the race card is played way too much automatically shut their ears. And so I, I like to teach, and as I've been giving these talks, I've been sort of crafting the way that I try to, to start the conversation. And I've made an analogy that I think is, you know, it's, it reminds me of my childhood in taking geometry. And when we had to do proofs, you have to then first start by saying, this is where we begin, a very simple statement of what you believe and what the truth is. And then as you go along, the work you do becomes more and more complicated, but it's still very simple because you know what the truths are that you started with. So I start these conversations by asking a few questions that when I, when I say that they should be simple, I want you to think about them as a simple question. There's so much more depth we can get into and we will get into them. And it's going to be difficult to do, I guarantee you. I'm gonna cut some people off as they answer because you're gonna get more into the answers than I intended at the beginning. But the first question that I will ask, and this is a question actually, not rhetorical. Are we all equal? And I want you to think about it before you answer, but do you believe that we are all equal? And the first person that answers, I want you to tell me why. So I have the luxury of being the person here that I can put people on the hot seat. This is probably very, very poor practice, but I'm gonna do it anyway. So the first person I'm gonna call on is Dr. Reed. So Dr. Reed, do you think, that's all right, that's what I did on purpose. Do you think that we are all equal? That's a, that's, a, that's a fair answer. I, I told people I wanted it to be simple. You said it depends. One sentence for why it depends. For those that may not be able to hear, she said that it depends on the perspective, and that to her, as a Christian, we're all equal in the eyes of God. And that's where it starts for her. Anybody with a, a different explanation or a different answer? Uh, in theory, yes, in practice, no. So legally, we all theoretically have the same legal rights, but in practice, oh, uh, it, according to the eyes of the law, in theory, we all have the same legal standing, but in practice, it doesn't really play out that way in the real world. Now, this is why I love conversation. We all have the same legal rights? Do we? We don't all have the same legal rights. You, why, why, why did you say that? So, right, yeah. So the answer was, for this one, in theory, we all have the same legal rights, but in practice, maybe we are not all equal. 
Uh, there are definitely groups for whom their legal rights are not equal to everybody else's or are not equivalent to ever, everybody else, and for whom their civil rights are certainly uh, some people consider a matter of debate. I don't, but you know, people are certainly debating them. Okay. All right. Also, also, even if you have the legal rights, that doesn't mean the law treats you the same. Like you can have, you can have it on paper. But that's not the way the system treats you. Okay. So I, I will stop with those for that first question because already something that I like to think as a simple beginning, right? You should think that there should be a yes or no for something that's simple, right? And if we are at the very beginning before we even started the conversation of are we equal, and there's already a lot of discussion around that, as this conversation gets more and more and more complex, it's no wonder that we have such difficulty getting onto the same page. So the second question that I usually start with after I say, are we equal, is do we all deserve equal access to everything? Do we all deserve equal access to everything? One head was nodding yes already. So she says no, and you'll go from priority to to the worst off. So you think that we do not deserve equal access, and it should start from it gives goes in terms of priority. Okay. How do you measure priority? How do you measure who's worst off? How do you measure who's worst off? Okay. Any other answers for if we deserve equal access to things? Right here. I would say we deserve equal access, but in order to achieve equal access, we have to distribute our resources to provide that access differently according to where um, somebody might fall in a constructed social ladder. Okay. So this is where I will tell in my best ability a condensed history of my life. So I'm from Nigeria originally. Both of my parents were physicians and we came to this country when I was three for my parents to pursue postgraduate education. They were already physicians and they had to redo their residency here and they redid their residency at Howard University. How about this? I can use this one. Hello? Oh, this one works again too. All right. So we, they did pediatrics at Howard and then they went on to Johns Hopkins and Georgetown to do their fellowships. We then moved to Indiana where I went to a, a private school from fourth grade to eighth grade in a predominantly white area. During that time, I was in speech team, debate, I played basketball, I played soccer, I was in plays, so I did A Midsummer Night's Dream, I did Othello, and all sorts of plays as a student. And I continued to play sports in different ways, and I sang, and I danced, and I acted. These things I'm giving you to paint a picture of what my life has been. I, I went from fourth grade to eighth grade in Indiana to Western Massachusetts, where I went to Deerfield Academy for, for boarding school. So I spent four years at boarding school in what is thought to be a, a very diverse group of individuals because people come from all over the world. But, and I love Deerfield, they did a wonderful job. But it was at Deerfield that I really realized a level of privilege that I had not seen before. And here I was coming, the son of two physician parents, and I was exposed to individuals that are lovely people, I'm sure, but the level of privilege and the difference was something I had not appreciated before. And that was the first time that I actually felt as though I was being treated differently because of my race. Because once again, I, in terms of socioeconomic status at that point, was no different from them, but they didn't know that. There was an assumption made about where I came from just because of what I looked like. And 
this is where, where I met Dr. Reed. I started intersecting some of my, the different identities that I have. Because I'm from Nigeria, and I'm Yoruba, and I speak my Yoruba language, but to some people in Nigeria, the way I speak my language sounds like an American, or sounds like the other tribe, because I don't speak it with the same accent, because I've lived in the States for 30 plus years. So I'm, I'm Yoruba, but even to the people of my culture, I'm an outsider to them in a way. And then I come to the States, and I am that African American who was black to people, but I'm actually an African and not an African American. And so there's another intersection of those. And then, within that, I'm a black person that to many acts white. So I'm too white for the black people, but I'm too black for the white people. As you continue unpacking my life and I play sports and I was interested in medicine, I was too much of a scholar for the athletes, but I was too much of a jock for the true academics. And then even as you go further into your life as a physician, so I, to continue my story, went to Stanford University, where I was an athlete all four years. I ran track and field, was All-American, captain of the team for two years, and was on my way to potentially training for Olympic trials and decided I wasn't going to train for the trials. I'd go straight to medical school. And so then I went to University of Michigan for medical school, where I continued to do theater and acting and dancing and singing and outreach. And I then ended up matching into orthopedic surgery at Yale. So I did. I was in my third year of orthopedic surgery at Yale when I had my spinal cord injury. So I jumped into a pool. I wasn't pushed. It wasn't a car accident. I didn't do a triple backflip. But I broke my neck, and I was paralyzed from my chest down and had very minimal use of my upper extremities. For the physiatrist in the room, I had a C6 incomplete spinal cord injury, which should make it such that I should not have the dexterity and the use of my hands that I do right now. So in medicine, as an orthopod, I was too emotional for orthopedics because I spent time with my patients and I talked to them. After my orthopedics residency and having my spinal cord injury, I went to Chicago where I did my acute inpatient rehab and I spent time there and on September 8th, about two plus months after my injury, is when I first had any regaining of motor function and I moved my leg. That changed the trajectory of my rehab in a way that then I started working on gait training. From there I went back to Indiana where my family lived at the time and I got a master's degree from Notre Dame in engineering science and technology entrepreneurship in which I worked with a group called Custom Orthopedic Solutions to work on creating solutions to people's problems. So we were working on orthopedics devices, but we were using computer-aided design and rapid prototyping and design thinking to, to really get to someone's problem and create a solution specifically for them using technology. And so I was able to start to look at things from a different lens. And as I was doing this residency, sorry, as I was doing this master's degree, the residency program in my town in family medicine actually asked me to join. And those of you in academic medicine know you can't just really create a spot in residency, but the timing was very just sort of serendipitous in that they'd already went to the ACGME to ask for an extra spot anyway, and then one of their residents had left to go to another program, so they had the space, so I was able to start off cycle, and I started my residency in family medicine in January of 2015, and I graduated from my master's degree in, in May of that year. So in medicine now, I am the orthopod that is now doing family medicine. So throughout my life, I say that I've had one foot in one world and one wheelchair wheel in the other, never fully feeling accepted by any one particular group because I had too many elements of the other group. And it wasn't until I was with my patients that I realized the benefit that this provided me was that I could always find something that I could relate to in my patients. And I, and I said that I'm going to do my best to not talk too much because I still have to get through this. But I wanted to give you that to give you some context now about where I'm coming from and some of the experiences I've had because diversity, equity, and inclusion is not something that I've just started now that I'm a faculty member. When I look back at my life, I realize that elements of diversity, equity, and inclusion were the things that I was always raised with. I've, I've, I've been writing a book, and it, actually just the other day, I came up with what I want to, to title it. I have a six-year-old son whose name is Alexander, and I'm going to think, title the book, Dear Alex. The reason being that all of the discussions that I've been having at Harvard and Yale and Georgetown, and these high-level discussions with deans and provosts, 
the themes of what we're discussing are the same conversations that I have with my six-year-old son. Share what you have. Don't judge people just because they're different than you. Put the toilet seat down. I mean it. It sounds like a joke, but these are things that, when I talk about putting the toilet seat down, that then gets into conversations about gender equity and things that people feel as though there aren't that many of them here, why do we need to do it for them in this way? If they want to use the toilet after me, they can put it down themselves. And these are the conversations that you have. So this first slide that I want to start with, I want you to tell me what you think when you see this slide. Many of you have probably seen this before, but I want you to tell me what you think of when you see this slide, and I'm going to share some things with you about this slide that I, I would be impressed if you bring them up. I would, I would be very impressed. In all the places I've been, people haven't brought these up, but when I, when I went through where I found this slide from, and I started reading some of the comments below the picture, you'd be very surprised about the things that people say. So what do you see, what do you think of when you see this picture? And if, if I, I don't know if there's anyone who is visually impaired in the audience, but there's a picture with two sides. One says equality, one says equity. And the side that says equality has three people standing on the same size box, and the three people are different heights, and only two of them can see over the fence to the baseball game. And the picture to the right, the, then the boxes are distributed in a way that the shortest person has two boxes, the person who's the middle has one box, and the person who's taller doesn't have any box at all. And they can all see the game and they're all at the same height. So what do you think of when you see this? Uh, meeting each person where they are. She said meeting each person where they are. Any other thoughts? The total number, ah, that's never been said. So the total number of resources used, that's why I love this, because people come at things from different lenses every time. So each picture has three boxes, but the boxes are distributed differently. So the total number of resources allocated is the same. That's wonderful. Um, I was really excited when I saw this on social media for the first time. I really um, loved it, but I can only imagine what the comment sections say. But I want you to do more than imagine. What do you think? I think it probably said that that one person had to give up their box so that the uh, shorter, the, so that the child could see. So she said that maybe someone said that the one person had to give up their box so that the other person could see. They had to give up their box to give to somebody else. Um, when I look at it, uh, I see that the barrier is still there. The fence is still there. So regardless of whether or not you're giving someone access, the barriers and the systematic things still exist. She said that the barrier is still there, that no matter what, you're giving people access, the fence is still there, the barrier still exists. I saw someone in the back middle. Uh, what, else, what I also would add is that why aren't they actually in the fan base? So jackpot right there. So that is something that, now I'm going to put a spin on it, that I read that I'd never thought of this. This is what I actually read that turned my stomach. So now when you say, why aren't they in the fan base, tell me what you mean by that. Like we're, because you're probably coming from it from a different angle than this comment that I'm going to refer to. Why aren't they in the fan base, what do you mean? Well, what I'm thinking of is that uh, one, it's a family of color, so there's implications there, but it talks about though they would like to be watching the game with everyone else, their resources probably aren't allowing them, even though we're trying to give them equity. So equity in what way? So the comment that I saw that just made me realize, and that I wanted to use this as my first slide, is because you have to acknowledge where you're starting from and who's already in the conversation. What the comment said was, why didn't these insert racial expletive here just buy tickets and go to the game like everybody else. So when we look at this, we think about providing access. And you saw it in a way that was on the positive. You still thought the resources that they have did not provide them the opportunity to get to the game. You looked at it from the how can we provide resources. There are people that look at this and what they saw 
was a, a family of color cheating the system, trying to steal to watch a game that they didn't buy tickets to. And so if they just bought their own gosh darn tickets, they could be in the stands like everybody else. And they said, that's the problem with this. They say, all these people here not willing to do any work and just looking for a handout. And then the comments continued along the same lines. And you can imagine on social media how it just evolved into whatever conversation people wanted to have. That then at the end of it you say, where did this even start? It started from someone trying to show the difference between equality and equity and actually providing resources and how you may have the same amount of resources that are allocated, how people may have different sets of needs. And that's what it turned into. So that is something that in our conversations about diversity, equity, inclusion, community partnership, if we don't acknowledge and if we don't realize that there are some people that feel that way, we're never going to be able to make a difference. I have a comment that I use that's called right, wrong, and reality. I don't, I don't argue anymore with people about what's right and wrong. Because just because the things that are happening are wrong, and if you just sit in your office or wherever you are and you argue about the fact this is wrong, it shouldn't happen, that's not going to change it if you don't acknowledge the reality that we're starting from. So before the next slide, I'll tell a quick story about I was in my third year of medical school in Michigan. And I had decided that I wanted, to go into general, I wanted to go into surgery. And so it was the first surgical rotation that I was on. I contacted the chief resident the day before we started our rotation. And I said, what is it that I need to be able to do to be prepared? How can I be as prepared as possible? And I wanted to get a jump start. That first day, we have orientation first. So orientation's at 7 a.m. And as you know, on a surgical rotation, they would have already rounded by 7 a.m. And so he said, come meet the team and be dismissed. So he told us to come at 5.30, meet the team before they round, and then we can be dismissed. So then I, wanting to go above and beyond, contacted the intern on that rotation, and I said, what is it that you're going to do to prepare for rounds, and how can we help you on that first day so that the second day we really hit the ground running? And he said, come in at 5.30, we'll print the list together, I'll show you what I do, and then we'll go through. I, not wanting to be an undercover gunner, told all of my classmates that were on the rotation, this is what I'm planning on doing. You all can come with me and join me as well. One of my classmates came along. So we get there at 5 o'clock, where we're supposed to be, and the intern's not there. And so I wait, 5.05, not there. 5.10, I text him. 5.15, not there. 5.20, he finally texts me back and says, woke up late, running late, print the list, get the numbers, I'll be right there. So luckily, it wasn't my first rotation, so print the list, get the numbers. I understand what that means. This was, I'm dating myself a little bit, but this is where I still have to go around to each door and pr get the actual rep, rep vitals and get the eyes and nose, put it down on a little sheet, and then copy that to put it on the list that we, we print out for everybody else. So we then divvied up the patients, we ran around, we got the numbers, and I thought, all right, we're, we're gonna be smooth, we're gonna help this intern out. He then shows up a few minutes before his parsed around, and tells us that on this particular rotation, there's supposed to be a cover sheet on the rounding list, which of course we don't know. The chief liked the list stapled in a certain way, which of course we didn't know, and slid under his call room door a few minutes before round so that he could review it. None of our lists had that stuff on it, and at this point we don't have any time to do that. So before we could any rectify any of these wrongs, the door bursts open, and this big bald man comes in the room and says, I start on time. The intern jumps up, follows him out, so of course we jumped up and followed him out too. When we got to the patient, the first patient room, and it was time to present, the intern slipped behind us, making it perfectly clear that we were going to be the ones doing the presentations on rounds. So, as I told you, it wasn't my first rotation, I wanted to be a surgeon, so I sprung into action and I said, all right, Mrs. Smith is a 23-year-old woman, post-op day two from a total pyrothyroidectomy, and I went through her vitals, I went through her subjective, her objective, I went through it, and I thought, I'm killing this, I got it. And then the chief says, what is the importance of the chem sticks? Huh? What is the importance of the chem sticks? I had no idea what he was even talking about. He looks at my classmate, Gabriel. What is the importance of the chem sticks? Gabe had no answer. He looks back at me. Did you research your patient? And I'm thinking, my patient? This is this fool's patient behind me here. And then he said, is this your first clinical rotation? I said, no. 
Do you have access to a computer? I said, yes. Well, then what is your excuse for not having researched your patient? And this continued for every single patient on rounds until we were finally dismissed. I tell this story because this chief, I wasn't going to tell the second part. The second part of the story, a couple of days later, I'm scrubbing in, scrubbing in next to him, and he looks at me and says, wars have been fought over water. I'm like, what in the heck? <laughs> I, think, I can't even wash my hands right in front of this man. But I realized he had turned his water off. You see on TV, you know, you just hit the thing and you start scrubbing and the water's just running. He had turned his water off as he was scrubbing to not waste water. And then he said that wars had been fought over water. He pulled me aside later and told me why he had treated me this way. He told me that I could tell you wanted to be a surgeon. And what I didn't tell you in the beginning of the story is that he, as one of the only black male chiefs in general surgery at Michigan, knew that if I wanted to be successful, I would have to be 10 times better to be seen as half as good. I say this because that's the reality of where we are, right? I don't have to like it, but the reality is that right now, things are different. So for someone that may not be able to see the image, I added an image that shows a third picture now that has one person who's the taller person who doesn't need any boxes to actually see over the fence, now has seven boxes. The person who needs one box to see has his one box. The person who needed two boxes to be able to see is now in a hole in the ground the, the size of what the boxes would have been. For certain groups, not only are we not given the resources, but we're starting from behind. And the people that have the resources have more than they even need. And that's a conversation that people aren't willing to have honestly. And the reason that I ask this and I do this is because the third question that I usually ask of people is, do you even value diversity and inclusion? And you would think that that would be a simple answer. But if you have a difficult time answering question one or question two, answering question three is even harder. Because where we are right now is at a place where even the people in the room that usually you're preaching to the choir when you come to things like this. We're at a place where there's a lot of wonderful work being done, but I feel as though we're still trying to prove to people why diversity is even important. People don't think it's important yet, even though we have data that talks about how more diverse teams do better. We talk about having a more diverse workplace is more efficient. We talk about having people that represent the communities that they serve and having a population that reflects that within medical, like within healthcare, is of benefit to our patient population, people still have a hard time believing that that is the case. And we are doing all of these wonderful efforts trying to prove that. The thing that is particular to today's talk, which I know I have very few minutes left, is this slide that I found recently that I think sums it all very wonderfully. When it comes to disability, the actual type of resource that you may need might not be the same as someone else's. So now I've added another picture that has three people once again. And the picture that shows equity has one person that has no box because they can already see over the fence, one person that has two boxes and then they can see over the fence, and then a person in a wheelchair that has a ramp to get them up to the top. It should seem like that is a logical, fair, right thing to do. However, the physical spaces that we occupy right now do not allow for this. Even in the institutions that are trying to do their best to provide access to people, even though we have the ADA, just because something is ADA compliant does not actually make it accessible. I have, a, I have an analogy, not even an analogy, a real story that I talk about an airport bathroom that I went to that was a wonderfully nice large bathroom. But the way that the door opened, it opened in and then hit the toilet seat such that I didn't have enough space to get into the bathroom and shut the door behind me just because of the way that the door opened. So they think, oh, well, we have enough space. You know, we followed all the rules and this is the right size. But you can't actually get into the bathroom stall and shut the door behind you. So then I'm forced to catheterize, which is not a big deal. I don't care. It's just the, you're going to watch me ass on you. But I'm not cathing, 
out in the open, and then people are looking and questioning why I'm doing it and why I don't just shut the door. And I, they had the nerve to ask me why I didn't shut the door. And I said, I would love for you to hop into this wheelchair and show me how you would have done that instead. So these are things that we need to realize. And the beauty of this and what I feel is that I've been blessed and honored to have an opportunity to add to my different intersections, to the different groups that I represent, is the fact that disability does not mean that that person can now no longer contribute to the overall society. I'll tell the last quick story here, which is I've told you that I was an orthopedic surgeon that then turned family medicine physician. So as a family medicine physician, we do OB as well. So if you start following this line down of all the potential things that may be awkward in this scenario, I'm an orthopod that's now a family medicine doc, a family medicine doc that's doing OB, and there's already a dynamic between OB from OBs and OB from family medicine. So at our program, we're taught OB by the OB, OB physicians because they're the ones that do the C-sections. So I'm a family doc doing OB, which already has its biases. And then I have a spinal cord injury, which gives me limited dexterity, right? The assumption could be that this ex-athlete orthopod family doc now trying to do OB with a spinal cord injury is the last person I'm getting anywhere near my patients. And a lot of the OB nurses, not to have any sort of gender assumption here, but are like mother hens and really take care of their patients well. But what happened at this program is they assumed competence is the phrase that I use. And instead of assuming that I wasn't going to be able to participate, despite my wheelchair, they allowed me to work with them to figure out how we were going to do this. And so if you can think of a situation in which you have a vaginal delivery that's not going well and you have to quickly get into the C-section suite and do a section, you need to do that quickly and you can't waste time. We created this device. I have the standing frame chair that you saw in the video. But this was before I had that chair. We created this device that allowed me to sit on this thing called a steady to get into the OR and to scrub in with them. Now, at no disrespect to my family medicine colleagues, when we got into the OR in the C-section at a time that is critical to get this baby out quickly, who do they now have sitting across from them in the operating room? Someone who had done three years of a surgical residency. So I was able to help them in a way with that surgery because I could predict when they wanted to lock the knot versus when they didn't want to. I could predict when they needed the suction because I'd done years of surgical residency. So they had a surgical resident with them in the C-section that they would have never realized had they not allowed me to now literally have a seat at the table. So when you assume that someone cannot do something based on race, gender, ability, you miss what that person could potentially be able to contribute. You miss all the different things that they bring. And you may not have any idea what those things are, but if you don't allow them to work with you and demonstrate that, if you don't allow them to help you to create a world in which they can make it better for all the other people that have their own differences, their own needs, then we miss the boat. And that could be said about race. That could be said about gender. That could be said about ability. And once again, when I tell you, these are the same conversations that I have with Alex. Because if you start from the beginning of thinking about whether we're all equal or not, and whatever your answer is, I think that we are all equal. I think that there are lots of things that make it such that we're not, but if you view people as the same, even if they're different, if you try to provide equal access to everyone, you don't start asking questions about how much one person gets versus how much the other person gets, because if you're doing what you need to do to provide access to everyone, then that's not an issue. The last thing I'll end on is a quote that someone told me at the end of one of my talks that said, don't strive for the known, which is finite. Instead, and it's a misprint, instead consider, not strive, instead consider the unknown, which is infinite. If we are trying to get to somewhere because we know what it's going to be, that's a limited scope. There are lots of things that we may not have the answers to yet. We may not know how we're going to get to the answers. But if you allow people with a diversity of experience and thought and and all sorts of different things to be at that table in that conversation, the unknown has infinite possibilities. 
So thank you very much. I, I apologize because I ended up getting all into my feelings and I, I took over this conversation we're supposed to have, but hopefully this starts the conversation for the day and provides some things that can be food for thought that can help stimulate the discussion that we'll have. So thank you very much. Thank you, Farami. Um, we have maybe time for one or two questions, if you don't mind. Yeah. One or two, and then that's it, because we want to try and stick to schedule as much as possible. Thank you for coming to speak with us today. I really appreciate your time. Um, it's great to hear about some of the efforts going on in medical education for medical students. Right now, I'm trying to f um, devise programs to transfer pediatric patients to adult physicians. And I'm constantly um, hearing from adult physicians that are currently practices, they're not ready to receive some of our disabled children um, or some of our children with behavioral disabilities. What are resources that you would point me to to help educate those physicians that are currently practice, practicing? So one of the things that I actually meant to mention at one point is that a lot of times I think that we have an abundance of resources that are attempting to help and to solve certain problems, but there's a disconnect between the resources that exist and the people that benefit from them. And so I had the pleasure of being able to talk to some students from HMS that, and Dr. Reed actually met with one of them recently. She's not in the country right now, so she wasn't able to be here, but she was someone that, she's been here, and this is no slight to the Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Partnership Office, but it's something that is existing in many, many places where we think we're doing work that's benefiting people, and we are, but the people that we want to benefit may not always know the resources that exist, right? But perception is reality. And so if people perceive that we're not doing something for them, then it's, a hard, it's hard to then get to them. So to directly answer that question, I think that something I said in the video of educating people at the beginning of their training, because it's not that you should give up on the people that have been there for a long time, but the saying of it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks is somewhat true and will have a hard time forcing a provider that's not comfortable caring for someone to care from them. And if we try to force them to do so, they're not gonna give them great care. But if we start to create providers by what we do in undergraduate, by what we do in the medical training, that we show them not only in terms of caring for this person as a patient, but just in terms of looking at them as a peer, right? Because people with disabilities are not just your patients. They're gonna be your peers too. And so by having people that you see at the table that you say, Dr. Golami is no different than anybody else in this office, and because he's here, I learned about this, I learned about that, I saw how he did this, I saw how he did that, you're not gonna be as uncomfortable with dealing with something. But I don't blame them, because they're uncomfortable because they haven't seen it. They're uncomfortable because they haven't had to ever address it before. And so just making them comfortable by saying, you need to do this, is not gonna fix it, right? And the resource needs to be the community that we're bringing up acknowledges the fact that all of these people are the same and have a voice to contribute. And therefore, when you then see that person in your clinic as the provider, or as the patient, it's not an anomaly. And the truth is, we aren't anomalies. There are plenty of people. There's Dr. Iazoni, who's gonna speak later today. Within your own institution, you've got Dr. Sherry Blowett as well. I mean, there, I'm just listing some people that I know, that I see. We exist. There was the AAMC report on disability recently came out. Right? There's an NPR article that addresses this as well. Dr. Landry's looking at me with the eye, so I've got to slow it down. But <laughs> these, these are things that what we're doing, and, I, and I'm, I'm honored and blessed to say that I think that there are a lot of people that have been doing this work a lot longer than me. But right now, there seems to be some, some buzz around it. So hopefully we can demonstrate that this is not just a, a hot topic or something that's going to be trending on Twitter for a short period of time but something that we can demonstrate and put into education to say that this is an important factor too. Because it's not just disability, right? It's race, it's gender. There are people that will say, you know, I, I've heard about these disparities in healthcare for African American populations and I just don't think I'm best suited to manage those things so you know, maybe they shouldn't be coming to my practice. That's why I start with the simple. The simple theme is the same no matter what marginalized group you're talking about. 
And if your goal is to provide access for everyone, we will do what we need to do to be able to give it them to them. And I think that direct answer is we start by addressing this pre-med and med to show that that's important and to teach these students to address it as well. Thank you. Let's give uh, Farami one more round of applause.